I want to thank each one of you for watching these videos. Uh, if you like the videos, please subscribe and uh, please hit the like button. These videos will continue and we'll see how far we can get into click PLC programming. Thank you. At the end of the last video, click 2, we said that we would begin programming, but we would program a red light. Now, I chose a red light because it's something that we're all familiar with, so there shouldn't be a whole lot of question about, okay, is this moving up or down, left or right, or so forth. All we have to do is just simply program a red light. The red light that we'll be pro programming to begin with will be very simple. It will run on timers only. There's no car uh, sensors to detect if a vehicle's in place or not. And uh, this is the configuration that we'll have. We'll have Elm Street that goes east and west. And then we'll also have Oak Street that goes north and south. And our red light, of course, will be here in the middle. Because everything will run on timers and there's no turn lanes, it's very easy to think, okay, we can use just one output, for example, for the red light for Elm Street East and Elm Street West, and do the same thing for Oak Street North and South then we wouldn't use as many outputs because there's 12 lights total. But because we know in the future we will be adding in turn lanes and uh, that would make Elm Street East and West changing at different times. So we want to have a separate outlet, outlet, excuse me, output for each light. Now going back into the software, all we've done with the software to this point is we've downloaded the software and upgraded the firmware into the PLC. You can see right now I have the run light on. That means I am connected, or this means I'm connected, I'm online. This means that the status of the PLC itself is in the run uh, position. I'll change that to uh, stop, for example. You see that turns to yellow. I have stopped the PLC. This is the only command rung that we have in the program, and all it was was an end statement just to make sure we didn't get a syntax error that we could um, download a program into the PLC, start and stop the PLC to verify that everything we did was correct up to this point. If I go back to the stop and start, change the PLC mode to a run, then you can see my end turns blue. That means it's being activated. There's a few more things that we need to look at before we just jump in and start programming. Number one, I want to go back into the function tab over here on the left and go down to system configuration. Now you can see this is the same configuration that we left with uh, on the last video. We are showing a power supply of uh, 500 milliamps. We're consuming 140 milliamps for the processor itself, for the CPU. And uh, the inputs that are fixed, the fixed inputs on this are already uh, dedicated input addresses, X1 through X4. And the fixed relay outputs right here are showing up here as outputs Y1 through Y4. And the analog input uh, signals are DF1 and DF2. And the output are DF3 and DF4. Now, let me explain a little bit. X's are always going to be the inputs. Y's are always going to be the outputs. And these are bits. That means it's either on or off. Now, the inputs uh, for the analog we know can be from 0 to 10 volts, 0 to 5 volts, uh, 4 to 20 milliamps, 0 to 20 milliamps, some type of value like that. So these will always be something in between these values. And depending on the type of D to A converter or A to D converters that we're using, it depends on what the count is, so how high the, the value can be. So these are double words floating double words of uh, floating addresses. So that's, that's what this is about. Now we'll talk more about this. Something else I want to show you here, this little uh, toggle that you have here, this little checkbox, startup IO configuration check. Now if I have this checked right here and I add in another module here, say an output module that's not actually on the PLC, when I try to download into the PLC and I tell it to run, immediately I'm going to get an error telling me it will not go into the run position. And when I uh, look, I'll see that I have an error. Let me close this. 
it'll show that I would have an arrow right here. This would be bright red, and I would be in the stop position. And then if I were to click on, on the PLC, well, I can't now because there is no error, a window pops up, and it tells me what the error is. And a configuration error, you cannot run with a configuration error. However, if this box is not checked, then you will not get the error, even though what you're showing here, uh, it does not agree with what's actually in the PLC. Now, right now I'm in the run position, like I said. <clears throat> um, we don't really have anything else to set up on, on this part right now, because all we're doing is just running the PLC itself, and we just have the power supply connected. Now, if I go to uh, PLC, you can see I've got a lot of information here, but basically it's the same information as you get if I click on PLC up here. Okay, I have clear memory uh, error. You can see I'm uh, connect and disconnect, write data to the PLC, write uh, read data from the PLC, write project, and so forth. So these are basically the same things that I've, I've got up here. They're, actually, they're all exactly the same things. And if I go back to the functions, there's a lot of function stuff you can set up. The first one we talked about was the system configuration, um, being this, this screen that we've already looked at. And then we can set up our communication ports. Uh, if we have Ethernet, we can set the IP addresses and so forth on that. Uh, we can, If we have uh, port number three, which this one does have, we can set up the Modbus communications or however we want to. You can actually set up a password in this so that but whatever program that you're using here, you can set it up so that no one can see what you've got in the program without putting in your proper password. They can't even upload if they connect to the PLC itself and try to upload. They cannot see what the program is. And so you can select what it is that you want to protect. So I'm, I'm keeping this turned off from right now. We're not trying to protect this. Where would that be a, a good example to use? Say, for example, you have a piece of machinery that you've designed and you have your own special little program and you don't want anybody else to go in and modify anything on it. You want to make sure it stays exactly the same and you don't want anybody to see what you've actually done because maybe it's secret. So you can protect those with a password. And the passwords on those can be uh, alphanumeric, so you've got quite a range of complexity that you can put it in the password. All right, we have a scan time. This is a good one to look at. This one uses the uh, system uh, bits, the system information, and the system always starts with an S. Now, we'll get into these just a little bit more a little bit later. Um, you can see right now that we're running a current scan time of three. Well, that's milliseconds. That means three thousandths of a second. It goes through, does all its checks, and starts back over and does it again and does it again and does it again because the computer, the PLC, will just continue to do the same cycle over and over and over and over and over. Right now, the only thing we're really running is these three steps right here. The first step says this is rung number one. The second step is means says there's all a straight connection. And the third step is we have the end command. That's all it is. So if we look at the memory, it's only going to say we're using three, uh, uh, three bits of the memory. Watchdog timer. Now, the watchdog timer means if you have a really long program and you're having it do a whole lot of different work before it can come back and start back over, uh, you'll, you can get an error uh, if it exceeds what you've got your watchdog timer set at. The default time is 200 milliseconds or a fifth of a second, which is actually very, very long. Uh, if you have a battery um, <clears throat> set up in here, you can set up when you install the battery and, and the, the default batteries typically are, they, they say, are good for five years. <clears throat> now then, you can, on this particular CPU module, you can do uh, uh, software interrupts. That means if you have something happen on an input that has to be seen immediately before anything else, you can sit uh, without waiting for the end of the scan time when it would uh, normally come back around at the beginning of the scan. Uh, you can set this up to, uh, for the interrupts so that they would stop the program at that point Go do whatever that you wanted to do at that time and then come back. <clears throat> um, CPU built-in I.O. setup. Now, this is what we've got set up right now by our system configuration. This is the PLC CPU that we're using. And it tells you right here uh, more detail about the different inputs. You can see X1, 2, 3, and 4 are all regular inputs. The current state is off. 
and uh, the description is just regular input. And the same thing for the outputs, just saying that they're just regular outputs and they're all off. And then for the analog, you can see this analog is set up for 0 to 5 volts on the input. The current value is 0. And <clears throat> then it just tells you this one here is set up for uh, 4 to 20 milliamps. It says that it's not used right now. And anyway, so you can see a little bit more detail about that. Um, <clears throat> High-speed inputs. Uh, this only happens if uh, you have the Ethernet modules. We don't have an Ethernet module here. This would be used for looking at, say, You've got an encoder that's giving pulses, say, I don't know, uh, 2,000 pulses uh, per, per second. <clears throat> that's a pretty high speed, and it's, it's faster than what you'd normally be able to catch. So you set up the high speed inputs to be able to read the encoders. With that, you have the, the A and the B uh, channels, so you can tell if the encoder is turning right, turning left, and it's good for following a position of a of a say, a, um, something on a conveyor or something, a position that you have a, a cylinder running at a certain distance and you want to make sure you stop it at a certain place or you control it to a certain speed. Uh, then you have some software setup information over here. But here's something else, too. You also have the complete software manual. <clears throat> and you can see here, you can see anything you want to see about the software itself. It's all right here complete. And you also have the hardware manual. So if you want to go down, this is in a PDF file format. It's built in with uh, the software when you do the downloads. So you can go on down to wherever you want to go down to and get in, any information that you're looking for. Let me grab this and pull down a little bit. Here you can start to see information here about using the D to A converters for the uh, um, analog outputs and the ADD converters for the analog inputs. Now A to D means analog to digital and uh, D to A means digital to analog. So what's in the computer is digital but what's on the outside world is analog. Now how these work we can talk about those a little bit later when we get to there, or quite a bit later actually. Um, but anyway you've got all the information that you want uh, about the PLCs, the inputs, the outputs, the specifications, everything is all completely included in that. Now Program. You see over here on the program, everything is going to be ladder programming. There's no other type of programming that you can do with the click PLCs. There's no function blocks. Uh, there's no statement list. Uh, these type of things are not included. It's just straightforward uh, logical, uh, ladder logic programming. Now, you have the main program, which it defaults to. And in that default, um, well, let's see here. Maybe... Uh, maybe it's in this right here. We can go to, um, there's a spot, I can't remember exactly where it's at. Well, you choose what colors these are going to be. Your main program, by default, is going to be white background. Now, your sub-programs, subroutine programs, we don't have any. I'm going to right-click on this to add a new subroutine program, and we'll just call it by the default name, subroutine1, and I'll click OK. Now, we've we've gone into this program, you can see the background is yellow. Now the same thing if I were going to do an interrupt program, I go to it and the background is pink. So as you move through the software while you're looking at things or making different things, it helps you remember that you're not in the main program or you're in this part because it can be confusing when you're moving back and forth a lot. Having the background colors is to me is a, is a big help. I'll delete this one. Delete. And I'll delete the subroutine uh, also. Well, I'll keep this subroutine in here for a little bit. We'll go back to the main program. Now, in the main program, like I said, the program will go rung by rung by rung by rung. And the last rung in the main program must be the end statement. That way it knows it's the end of the program. It's time to go ahead and update uh, the values uh, from the PLC uh, to the uh, output that are actually connected to it, the physical outputs. And then it goes back to the beginning. It does a safety check to make sure everything on it's working right. It reads the inputs that you have, and then it starts to process the, your main program again, rung by rung by rung. So let's say, for example, I wanted to do something in a subroutine. Maybe I wanted to read all my inputs. I've got something that has 
15 inputs and I want to keep them out of the main program because it could get a little confusing having so much stuff in the main program. So what I would do is, uh, maybe for this rung here, I would give a call statement down here from the right hand side, double click, and yes, I'll, I've only have one subroutine. This is how you call a subroutine. I'll call this one. Okay, now then I have that. Now I, I still have to have an end statement. Put my end statement back in. So now then, what I'm doing in rung number one is I'm saying go to subroutine number one. So it goes to subroutine number one and it processes whatever I have here, but it has to know when it finishes the subroutine. So for that, we put in a return statement. A return means this is the end of the subroutine to go back to where you came from. So you came from the main program. So right now, we have a statement, a line coming in. It says go to subroutine number one. It goes to subroutine number one. It says it processes the, uh, the rung number one. It says return. So it goes back and returns, comes back to the main program. And the next, call, the next rung in the main program is rung number two, which is just the end statement. Let's just take this and we'll go to PLC and we'll tell it to write the project into the PLC because we have modified it. Down here you see on the syntax, when it did a <clears throat> verification of the program, it said there's zero errors and zero warnings. So now then, this is again showing me what I have in the, <clears throat> in the uh, computer, and this tells me what I have in the CPU. You can see I've only got nine steps of program size here, and I only have three steps inside the CPU. That is nothing. That's not even close to 1%. So I'm going to say, okay. PLC is in the run mode. Do you want to st uh, change the stop mode? I have to say yes here because the click PLC does not support runtime edit. Transfer is complete. Go back into the run mode. See how simple that was to make a change in the program? Download it and now the program is running. If I go to the subroutine, I can see my return here is blue. That means it's being activated. It's being uh, operated on in the program. It's doing, the program is doing, the PLC is doing what the program is telling it to do. So it comes back to here, does the same thing. So this is just to show you the, the, the range of motion of the program. Now, let's go and take a look at this. Under program, we have something that's called the address picker. The reason I'm coming into this is you have to know how the address is. Some, some uh, times they're called registers, depending on whose software that you're looking at. All the X's, like I said before, are inputs. So you can see we go from X1 to X16, and then it goes to X101. Well, the reason is, on a slot, and remember we talked that you could have as many as eight different slots uh, on the configuration of inputs, you can have a maximum of 16 inputs. Okay, now this first number, this first one here, this is X001, and if you look at 16, it's X016. Now that X tells you that it's an input, the zero tells you that's slot zero, that means it's on the CPU itself, and then this would be um, output number 16. All right, well, the very next one is X101. Well, the X means it's an input. One means this is the module that's in slot one, and 01 tells you it's bit number or input number one on that slot. Now, this is on the Xs. If I click on the Ys, I see the same thing for the Ys. They're, breaking, they're broken down exactly the same. Now then, if I have an input module in slot number one, and I try to address this over here, it's not really going to be a problem because there's nothing for this one to go to. It will only, if you try to address um, <clears throat> um, this address right here, there's nothing it's going to do there's, because you've got inputs in that slot number one. So the only bits that would be active would be these right here. Now then, 
We've talked about the X's are always inputs. And look how many you can have. You can have eight slots, just like we talked about. You've got zero for CPU, then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. The eight different uh, uh, slots for input modules. The same thing is true with the Y's. On this, you can have up to eight uh, different, different modules. But now look what happens when I go to the C's. Well, what are the C's? The C's are bits also, just like the inputs and outputs. That means they're either a one or a zero. But when I go to C1, for example, look how the address goes. When I get to 16, it just keeps going. 17, 18, 19, 20, and it goes all the way until I get to like the 98, 99, 100. It just keeps on going. So if we go all the way down to the end of our C's, you can see we could have as many as 2,000 other status bits that we're checking. So okay, this one could say, okay, we have a car here, we don't have a car here, this timer is finished out, whatever we want to call it, you know, <clears throat> we can call it whatever. And when we talk about calling, that's where we put the nicknames in. For example, um, over here, X1, I could just type in right here, input 1. Take that, I could take that and copy it, paste it down here, and then just change that to a 2. Change that to a 3. Change this to a 4. Now then, I know I've got four inputs on that um, on the uh, CPU, so I, would, I could label all these right now. And where does that make a difference? I'm going to take this back to a stop position. And I'm going to come into the first uh, step of rung number one, and I'm going to put a contact right there. Double click on the normal open contact, and I'm going to tell it that it's going to be input number one. Now you can see it's showing the physical address, X001. So I know physically on the CPU, on the PLC grouping itself, that that's what it is, but I'm calling that input one. I could also call it car sensor number one, whatever I wanted to, to call it. So then I'm saying if I have this input over here, then I want to call this subroutine. And then it would process whatever's in the subroutine, it would finish that, and then it would come back into rung number two, the very next rung, and process whatever's in this one. But being able to put a nickname will make a lot of information following your program so much easier. So we talked about the X's being the inputs, the Y's being the outputs, the C's being status bits, and now we have the T's. These are timers. Like we said, the PLC uh, red light that we'll be programming will work on timers. So if I look at timer number one, I could call this uh, timer one, for example. All right. And then... Uh, We'll talk about the timers a little bit more later, but you can see how many timers we have. Uh, 20, 21, how far does this go up? We could have as many as 500 timers. That's a lot of timers. When you have that many, the numbers don't really mean anything. We need a name or something that helps us keep our heads straight when we're trying to work through the program. All right, next we have the CTs. The CTs are counters. And you can see the numbering system goes just like it does on the timers. It just continues, it just normal base 10, all the way up to 250. We can have 250 counters. Uh, and as we said before on the timers, we could have uh, 500 timers. So that's a, that's a lot of timers and that's a lot of counters, a lot of information that you can keep up with. And when you're trying to program that much, it's very, very important that you have names, nicknames, for um, these timers. For example, this timer uh, 2485, maybe it, uh, you would use that one and you would call it um, uh, Left Turn Timer uh, Elm Street East, for example. Because if you just have it going 485, you're looking at the program and your, your eyes just start to cross. Okay, now then the S, SCs. Um, we have a lot of those. Not all of them are being used. A lot of them are being reserved. But you can see the nicknames on all the status uh, system status bits always start with an underline. 
Now these are just bits that they're just on or off. So you can see this are, these are just tell you the status of different things. PLC mode, for example, would be on or off. Uh, it's running, it's not running. Uh, battery needs replacement. Uh, there's a memory check error, so forth. These are just individual bits. <clears throat> it would let you know, say, for example, if you're doing a mathematical function and the value that you come up with is out of range for the, um, um, for the uh, whatever the word is that you're working with. Also, um, there's the real-time uh, clock information. There's a lot of information that's available here. Uh, port information to set up your communications. Mo tells you when something has been sent, when it's ready to be sent. Uh, Ethernet uh, control for those ports. The next is the DS. D for data. Uh, S, I guess, means a single. So these are single word uh, datas. And you can see that they're all integers. Now you've got quite a, a range of these as well. My gosh, it goes 4,500. <laughs> you can have 4,500 uh, words of storing a data in there maximum. Now, something else too, you've got a limit on your memory of all PLCs. It doesn't matter whose it is. So maybe you want to use more counters and not so many timers. So therefore, maybe you're not using all of the, all the programming capability of it. But these addresses are fixed addresses, and you can put data in every one of these addresses and not over exceed the memory. The problem becomes when you try to add you know, thousands and thousands of rungs of programming with it, then you start to come into a problem a little bit. <clears throat> uh, the next is the uh, double datas. <clears throat> and these are INT2s. Um, a, a single data here, for example, these are integers. Um, they're only a 16-bit word, so you're only, you can only go up to like 32,000-something um, as far as the maximum number size. On a double word, you've got uh, uh, 32 bits for your value, so you can go to a much, much larger number. All right, and there again, you have a large number of those. You can have 1,000 double data words. All right, next is the uh, data in the hex format. We're not going to use any, you can see the, the format here is all hex. We're not going to use anything in hex on this right now, so there's no reason for us to look any further on that, just to know that, that, that it is there. And then you have the DF. That's the data and the floating value. All right, these are double words, but the biggest thing is, is you can have a decimal point in these. You can't have a decimal point unless it's a real number or a floating real number. By some uh, PLC companies, they call it a real number. Others just call it a floating number. But you can have different values. Say, for example, you have something that's going to be 14,200.723. Uh, then that, that type of information will be stored in a floating data value, a DF1, for example. Um, then you have the XDs, which is your input words. And if you look up here, all you have is just eight, uh, uh, excuse me, nine words, zero through eight, and each one. Uh, is going to be just 16 bits, and all you're going to get from that is um, the status of, uh, the, the well, you can read only on these. You see the R means you can read the values only. You can't change those values. Those are based on what's actually hardwired and coming into the PLC to those uh, particular inputs. This would be the CPU, slot 1, slot 2, slot 3, and so forth. <clears throat> and then you have the same thing also for the outputs. It's exactly the same, except you can read and write to the outputs. Then you have the TDs, which is uh, timer data. So for each timer, you have a word here, a 16-bit word, which uh, stores the value that that timer is at, at right now. For example, if you have a timer and it's counting 0 to 2,000, any time that you look at it, uh, this word right here, uh, you'll be able to see, if you're monitoring, you'll be able to see the actual value of that timer. And the same is true down here for the counter uh, datas. You have a, a counter data word uh, for every uh, counter. Now, notice also these are uh, INT2s. That means these are double words. Whereas on the timers, they're just single words. You can only go up to 32,000 something on a timer value. So if you needed something longer than that and you're in seconds, you would need to change to, um, to say, minutes and, um, and divide by 60 or whatever. But... On the counters, the counters can go up to a much, much higher number. You can see that these are all double integers, so they go to 32-bit words. Now then you have the system data words, 
which here it gives you the actual value. Instead of just saying that you have an error code, it will tell you what the code is by a, a code number, for example. And uh, here, for example, it tells you on the real-time clocks, the year, so forth. These are not bits anymore. These are actual words with values in them. And then text, uh, for example, if uh, text would be used if you're using something with ASCII. Say, for example, you've got a device and it has to etch in um, a serial number on a part. So it can only talk ASCII, so therefore you'll have to send a value in ASCII to it so that uh, it would say, okay, I'm ready to write, this is what I'm going to write, and it, you would send that value in ASCII, and then you would send another bit to it or another command telling it to go ahead and, and uh, scri uh, inscribe the uh, serial number on the part. So that takes care of understanding what the, how the data works, how the registers are set up. Let's um, <clears throat> take a look real quick at how we would uh, actually use a timer. I'm going to take this from the run, take it back to the stop position, stop mode, and click on the end statement here, and I'm going to change that to a timer. And let's just pick the timer, timer number one. All right, and we'll give it a set point of, say, 4,000, or well, let's give it 5,000. Something that we can see a little bit easier. Then the, the units right now are milliseconds. Say, for example, I could change that to seconds if I wanted to, but 5,000 seconds would be a long time for us to sit and wait and watch something happen. I'll leave it at milliseconds. Uh, and this will show the current value of it right now if I'm looking at it online in status. But you can see, uh, if I change this to seconds, this also changes to seconds. So it's telling me that the timer data for uh, timer number one is in seconds. So now if I change this back to milliseconds, that's what we want. Now then, we have two types of uh, timer delays. We have an on delay and an off delay. An on delay example would be, say we have a car that's pulled up to a red light and the sensor detects the car. We want to wait maybe 30 seconds before we tell it the light system to change and begin another cycle to change from a red light to a green light, for example. And an off delay example would be the car was there, the light turned green, and now the car left. So you want to wait 30 seconds before um, the light starts to go yellow and red. That would be the difference between an on delay and an off delay. You can select that right here for which type of timer it's going to be. And <clears throat> the current value option, you can retain the value if the timer is disabled. For example, if you want it to continually uh, count or basically uh, count seconds or whatever, and every time that something is happening, you only want to count that time. Maybe this will be a runtime counter. So you want to know how many hours this machine has been running or how many minutes this machine has been running. So every time the machine stops, even though the PLC program is still running, you don't want to increase that. Uh, right now, we're not going to retain any of these values. We're just going to keep everything uh, just like it is. We lose power to the timer. The timer resets back to zero. So now we have our timer, but we don't have any controls for the timer. This T1 is a status bit for this timer. It will only energize when the timer has reached the whatever the set point value that you have in here. When this TD1 value, the timer uh, current value, has reached the set point value, then this bit will turn on right here. So we're going to use this bit to reset our timer. I'll come back over to the area over the first area over here, and I'm going to put in a normally closed contact. And we will call this one T1. Right? So now we have that. <clears throat> so what happens now is as the program goes through and it gets to rung number two, it comes here and it sees that um, I have a complete path going straight to the timer. So the timer is timing. Now, the timer will continue to time until T1 uh, changes state. It means the timer has reached its uh, set point value. Then that means this will energize. Well, when it energizes, this normally closed contact will open up, and there will be no longer a complete path going to the timer. At that time, the timer value goes back to zero, and it resets. So the program finishes. It goes through its loop. It comes back around the next time, goes to rung number one. It gets to rung number two, and it says, oh, T1 is no longer energized. Therefore, I have the complete path back in here again. The timer begins again, and it will time again 
uh, starting off at zero until it reaches the 5,000 where T1 would become energized again. Now I want to look at this value and be able to do something with it. So I want to, um, I'm going to put something in here called a compare. And the compare, um, I'm going to look at whatever the value is in TD1, timer uh, data number one, and I'm going to say if it's greater than, let's see, we'll go half of this, 2,500, and that would be two and a half seconds, and I'm going to say okay. So now then, if timer one value is greater than two and a half seconds, I want to do something here. So I'm going to set an output bit, not an output to the cord, but a output a status bit. And that status bit, I'm going to just use C1. There. <clears throat> so now then, I want to turn on status one when that, whenever that happens. So now this is going to complete the little program that we have right now. So I'm not going any further. So I need the end statement. Now I have the end statement. Let's go ahead download this or write this into the pro project into the PLC. Okay. Transfer is complete. Go into the run mode. Now I have monitoring turned on. So I can turn the status monitor off and turn the status monitor on. I've got the status monitor turned on right now. You can see the value in TD1 right here you can see as it's going up, it's getting closer to 5,000. Oh, it got there and it went back down to zero. Now, the T1, it's only going to happen once every 5,000 milliseconds. This is going to change state. So it's probably, you'll never see this change. It's probably going to be, look blue all the time, meaning that you have the complete path going through here. Now, T1 would turn blue uh, if it were energized. But like I said, it's only going to be energized at the one um, cycle where this reaches 5,000. Now, here um, on my compare, you can see I have TD1, and I'm comparing that against 2,500, and I'm saying if it's greater than that, I want this to be completed, and you can see this turns blue when it's complete, and it also turns on this bit, my output right here. I can say my timer now is above uh, 2,500, or it's greater than two and a half seconds. So out of every five seconds, this will be on half the time. So that's essentially how a timer works. We've just begun our programming. This takes a long time, but we have to go step by step. So when we come back for the next video, we will be actually looking at the specifications for how we're going to do the red light, setting it up, and begin to program the red light. Before we go, let me do one more thing real quick. Um, I would like to label some of these and maybe make a little, couple little changes here. I want to go to the stop. And uh, instead of this being C1, I want to make it an output. So I'll double click on it, come back to the selections, and I said my outputs are Ys. So I'm going to make this Y1. Now then, <clears throat> I have this as Y1. And now I'm going to make this one also another output. And I'll make this one Y2. Oh, I don't want to forget the end statement I have to have here at the end of everything. And now Y2, I want to put a contact here that if I don't have um, this one here, Y1, then I want Y2 to turn on. This will give me blinking Y1, Y2, Y1, Y2. Every two and a half seconds, they'll blink. Now, here's something that I kind of consider a shortcoming of the Click uh, software. I would love to be able to just click on this or maybe just right-click on this and be able to add a, a nickname. Well, the only way you can add the nickname, apparently, is you have to go back into the program back into access, uh, excuse me, uh, address picker, and then I would go to T's, T1, and here I will call this maybe a five second time. Uh-oh, I can't use that. I hit a wrong button in there somewhere. Five second time. Okay, now then, 
I have that. I also want to go ahead and label these outputs. Um, let me uh, put a label in here for this one. We'll call it uh, uh, red light and call the next one green light. Okay, so now, oops, I did not spell it right, did I? Green light. And I have to click OK, otherwise it doesn't save it. Now then, <clears throat> you can see these are showing up in here now. So I haven't made much of a change to this. I've only made it where I actually go to real outputs because we do have outputs uh, Y1, 2, 3, and 4 on the uh, PLC unit itself. So now I have to download this. So let me do a download. Right project into PLC. Okay. Go back. Yes, go back into run mode. And now you can see my lights will be blinking back and forth. And I can actually hear the PLC clicking as the outputs change back and forth. So that takes us just a one step a little bit further down the road. Oh, I'm Miss this a little bit, my cursor. See how the cursor can move over? All right, I've got my cursor back where you can see everything again. I want to drop this down a little bit as well so I can see a few more. So now we have uh, lights that will be blinking that we've called red light and we've called a green light. And you can see they're alternating back and forth. So that concludes the uh, lesson, and uh, we'll see you on the next one. Thank you very much.